Why hello there, wizards, gnomes, knights, and witches, and whatever is in between. Uh, welcome to another video where we are going to be looking at Mythic Mischief Volume 2 by Ivy Studios. Now, full disclosure, before we go any further, this game was sent to me by Ivy Studios to cover and give you guys a preview. And also, the previous campaign, Mythic Mischief, I actually went and all in for myself and bought that game. So uh, just so that you guys have that information before we go any further here. I also do want to let you know that this is technically not a finalized copy of the game, so some things are subject to change, so just kind of be weary of that. But I will say that Ivy Studios has some of the most beautiful prototypes in the game. They always look so beautiful. Now let's go ahead and look at the rulebook in order to give you a little game overview, and perhaps I'll add in a little voice there to make it a little more special. Nestled within the enchanted grounds of Mythic Manor lies a mesmerizing hedge maze. Outside of select class visits, access to the hedged garden is strictly off-limits to the students of Mythic Manor. This policy is diligently enforced by the mysterious groundskeeper. This led to a new competition among the students who can hide in the hedge maze without getting caught. The groundskeeper makes daily rounds in the school hedge maze, but a copy of their task list has fallen into the student's possession. They know exactly where the groundskeeper is headed and in what order. The only thing they can change is the path the groundskeeper will take to get there. It's the perfect chance for the students of Mythic Manor to once again prove who is the best in class. Let the games begin. So how does the game actually work? Well, glad you asked. Essentially, there is going to be the groundskeeper. Now this groundskeeper, this awesome big honking figure is going to be in the center of the hedge maze. There's gonna be three points that are determined by a card and those points are actually gonna show where the groundskeeper is going to move. So you'll know exactly that this groundskeeper is going to move towards point one at four spaces a turn, then point two, then point three. Once they make it to that third point, it's actually gonna to go to an after dark mode where essentially the groundskeeper, since it can't see very well, will actually be moving at a three spaces per turn instead of a four spaces. So you're gonna be taking control of one of the four asymmetric factions in the game. You're gonna be either the fairies, the gargoyles, the werewolves, or the gnomes. And you're going to be trying to put your opponent's mythic students in front of the groundskeeper as the groundskeeper makes its path. Players are gonna be making their turns, essentially spending down these action dice. They're gonna have these action dice slotted into each of their abilities on their player board, and they're gonna be spending them down, and for each notch they go down, they're gonna be able to do that ability. So if you have three movement at the beginning of the game as the gargoyles per se, you can just notch one down and then move one of your mythics. Or maybe you have your distract ability here. You can notch that down and move the groundskeeper one space towards one of your gargoyles. This is kind of how you actually activate actions and you're gonna be basically spending all of these on your turn and then the groundskeeper is going to move. Then, as the groundskeeper moves, if it runs into any of your opponent's mythic students, you're gonna be collecting a point for that. Then, it's gonna pass off to your opponents and they're gonna do the same thing. And so, it is a game that kind of plays like a dance, where you're gonna be trying to get their students in front of them, but also trying to keep your mythics away from the groundskeeper so that it's harder for your opponent to get your mythics caught on their turn. Now, there are a couple of things to make note of, especially in the movement of that groundskeeper. There are going to be a couple of obstacles. So at the beginning of the game, you're gonna be choosing or drafting a setup for all of these hedge mazes and clutter tokens. Now, clutter tokens will add an additional movement to anything. That means the groundskeeper will take that into account for the quickest path, but it's also an additional movement for any of your mythics or your opponent's mythics to walk 
on. And the hedge mazes, you can't move through them, but oftentimes you can change the direction or movement and every single faction can kind of manipulate the hedges a little differently. And using both of these obstacles is going to be the main way that you're actually gonna get the groundskeeper to catch your opponent's mythics. Just a couple of simple moves of these hedge mazes can actually change the path of the groundskeeper drastically. And the game is over when either one team reaches 10 mythic points or when the groundskeeper reaches destination three on the after dark card. Whoever has the most mythic points by the end of the game at that point would then take the victory. So you know how the game works, you know what you're trying to do, but how exactly do you do what you need to do, which is score points, which is get those mythics in front of the groundskeeper? Well, the answer is different for whichever faction you're actually playing, which is what I love so much because y'all know I am a huge fan of asymmetry in my games. All of these factions actually have two things that are going to be the exact same no matter which one you play. The first is going to be movement. You can always just move your piece. The basic movement's gonna be the same for every faction. The same is also going to be of distract. This is an ability that you can use in order to make the groundskeeper move towards one of your mythics. So those are gonna be the same no matter which faction you choose, but the rest is all going to be asymmetric and unique to that faction. So let's talk about the gargoyles. The Gargoyles are the debate team of Mythic Manor, and for being known mostly as the statues that crown great architecture, they are extremely mobile in their movement as a faction. Their glide ability allows them to move a space, taking a surrounding mythic with them, while their perch ability allows them to move a space, taking an adjacent hedge with them. However, it's not all about moving and flying for the Gargoyles, as they have a legendary ability to make a Gargoyle turn to stone, making them immovable and making it impossible possible for the groundskeeper to catch them. And once the after dark phase takes place, their rubble ability makes them one extra move to get past. But if the gargoyles are a little too serious for your liking, you can try the fairies. They are the class clowns, a whimsical magical bunch that have a few tricks to turn your frowns upside down. They love to make people wander aimlessly, hence their wander ability allows them to move mythics diagonal to them and then move them in orthogonal space in any direction. And their antics ability allows them to take an adjacent hedge and place it adjacent to an enemy. The legendary ability allows one of their own fairies to swap spaces with the groundskeeper. After dark, they can attach a fairy ring to an enemy and control that enemy once per turn. Basically, mind control, but you know, that's, that's fine. It's all fun in games, right? The rebellious werewolves are not for the faint of heart. These rocking canines love to jam and often can be found in detention. They can fling mythics two spaces perpendicular to their own wolves, and their legendary ability actually allows one of them to fling mythics over hedges. Heave is an awesome ability that takes an adjacent hedge and moves it in a direction until it must stop. So you can make some really big sweeping hedge moves, but it can be a little hard to tame its power. And after dark, they can actually change the board's layout by shredding up an adjacent clutter token or hedge once per turn. And finally, we have my personal favorite, the gnomes. These hippie lawn loungers are one with nature and one with themselves. They have to be up close and personal in order to make things happen, which is why they have a special alternative to moving called burrow. They can use Burrow to move two spaces, avoiding hedges, which is their main way to escape or to get up close to their opponents. The Shifty ability allows them to move an adjacent mythic to an adjacent space to their gnome, while their Illusion ability works the exact same way except with hedges. When they have exhausted their dice, their legendary ability allows them to drink a potion to reset any one of their dice on their board for the turn, allowing them to do quite a bit more. And after dark, they can make some changes to the hedge maze by being able to move a destination token one space, which I have found to be so much fun. So that's just kind of a quick reference of what all of these factions currently do. And you can kind of see exactly why this game is so puzzling because you're looking at the board, you're looking at where the groundskeeper is and you're thinking, okay, how do I get my opponent's mythics in front of this path? How do I, how do I put them there this 
turn and how can I get that 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 oh so good feeling three point turn where I catch all my opponent's mythics in one turn which feels so dang good. So I've explained how the game works, what you're trying to do, and I've also explained the abilities and what factions you have to choose from. But I did leave a couple things out that I did not explain, and I'm going to explain those now. First up is going to be the tomes. Like I said, there's gonna be tomes scattered around the board, and what you're trying to do is throughout the game, you can kind of focus on one of two things. You can you can focus on how do I get my opponent's mythics in front of the groundskeeper, but also how do I collect as many tomes this round as I can? Because the more tomes you have, the more you can actually upgrade your abilities. You're gonna have dice in the slots and it will show you how much you have per each dice. But if you put a tome in there, it basically goes to the leftmost space and pushes all those dice to the right, giving them more more and more actions. Getting the tomes early game can be really good because then you can have more movement, you might get more distracts or more of your other abilities. Also, if you use your legendary ability, you take the tome out, well, you can reset that legendary ability and do it again if you choose to take one of those tomes and place it into that empty space. So the tomes are another added layer to the game's kind of strategic gameplay. Do I try to catch as many of those mythics early game or am I just gonna try to go for the tomes early game and then use my benefit of having a lot of actions to get the mythics later? But by that point, maybe the mythics are in a worse spot. So many things to think about in this game. So you know how the game kind of works and you also know the theme of the game, but how does the game really feel to play? This is probably one of the most brain burning games I've played in quite a while. Me and my wife love to enjoy this game with a cup of hot coffee on a nice cool day and we sit down on opposite sides of the table and basically just give each other looks of, and we essentially think about what exactly is the best possible move here. It's, it's always such a funny time when we set up the very first time and my wife will just be looking at the board and eventually I could just see her brain just moving in the background and she is trying to figure out what exactly is the best way, how can I score three points this round, how can I get all of Sam's mythics caught? And then it just goes back and forth and we're each trying to outsmart each other each round, trying to trick each other each round. It is a really, really enjoyable puzzle. So I have only played the two player mode, but I do wanna let you know that you can play solo. There is rules for it. There's a deck of cards for it that you can check out. There's also a four or three player version of the game where essentially you either go 2v1 or 2v2. And just to let you know, this game can be mixed with Mythic Mischief Volume 1. So you've got a whole foray of factions to play with on that side as well, including some of my favorites, the zombies. You've also you also got the trolls, you've got the Frankensteins, the ghosts, the witches, the wizards. Um, I know I'm sure I'm missing another one, but just so many more asymmetric factions to play around with. But guys, that is it for Mythic Mischief Volume 2. If you are looking for a game to play where you want to just have your brain burn to the point of boiling like a hot witch cauldron, uh, and it overflows every single turn, and it's like you can't get the boil back from the previous round because this round is also brain burning. This is the game for you right here. Uh, it is a mind bender, but an absolute blast to play. I want you guys to check this out because like I said, those asymmetric factions, you can get better at a couple of them. I'm definitely more in line with the gnomes and werewolves of this set. Those are my two favorite factions. So. Definitely check out the Kickstarter page. I'll have a link down in the description. I hope that this video brought value to you. Let us go ahead and drop the beat. Yeah. 